I'm originally from California, um, where, where uh, environmental issues came out quite early. California is one of the first places that started recognizing uh, at least regional environmental problems. It was the first place in the world with environment, environmental impact assessments. And this was happening in the 70s when I was growing up uh, as a teenager. So um, I think I was affected by this environmental thinking early on. Um, at the same time as when I started university in the um, 80s, that uh, the book The Limits to Growth came out. And in my my first freshman year, we were given this, um, the counter book, the counter proposal, which is the, I think it's called The Resourceful Earth, which is like the conservative answer to the limits of growth saying that, no, no, there's no, there's no limits to growth, basically. Um, so we were giving that is in the freshman year of political science as, these two, um, two different op op oppositional ideas. So I think I was exposed quite early to this concept. I mean, the limits of growth is, is so central to the whole collapse thinking. This was the best science of its time in the early 70s, trying to figure out you know, what's going to happen. And apparently the predictions are spot on. Um, things are coming true, just as it was said in 19... 72 with the limited computing possibilities they had at the best computing center in the world at that time. Um, so, and these things have grown. So, I mean, I understood there was serious environmental problems and I, I studied international relations at that time. So looking at, you know, what was happening globally. So I was always a big picture person, um, understanding that the, yeah, things have to be different, things have to be reformed. Um, and I had also from the teenage age looking for the answer for a better model. Um, so I was in, interested in uh, sort of utopian uh, community examples before I had even heard of the word echo village, which wouldn't have been until much later in the late 80s, I first came in contact with the concept of echo villages um, and then knew about eco villages um, before actually getting involved in the eco village network in um, well 2008 2009 um, so it was it's a, like been a very long process of visiting communities and seeing alternative alternatives to the mainstream um, but really putting things together and seeing that that a lot of basic functions um, yeah, of society are maybe not holding well um, in, in other countries as well. If you have a wide view of what's happening in, in whatever, Somalia or Venezuela or Lebanon or something like that, you can see that things don't work well everywhere. So some people are already experiencing collapse. Um, and then you start to see the breakdown of the ecological system as well. Um, and everything is pointing in the same direction as as was was predicted by limits of growth. So I think it's it's been sort of creeping up um, the concept of collapse. I think uh, that's why I was shocked uh, this summer when I saw at the Gen Gathering that I was mentioning it in a film made in 2019. So apparently, um, collapse has been with us and it's just growing and growing and we get more and more information in the in the mainstream news on a daily basis that shit thing, thing things are not going well yesterday's news was um with the climate research that we're looking at two and a half degrees to three degrees warming um which is not manageable so we there's a lot of information out there and and somehow it most people it just passes them by but i think uh, people that have already sought out the echo village movement understand that big changes are needed um and that we have to prepare ourselves for collapse and that's something that i've been thinking more and more of of and maybe i was hoping 
that the you could say the mainstream political system would have been much more receptive to the the very very clear scientific information the what, what the visible results to shift things radically but i can see that's not happening um that was also the report that we're actually increasing uh emissions uh, and this is just the climate issue i mean we have uh, all the other planetary boundaries that we're crossing as well and we're even crossing them even worse than on climate so we see that uh, and i'm in in sweden and it's been very uh personally crushing for me to see uh sweden who i would think would be a very conscious uh, um electorate just now elect uh a very nationalistic um ultra conservative government that abolished the ministry of environment um put it under uh um trade and energy uh which just is, is just shocking uh that uh, but it's not sh shocking it, this is also a prediction that we're on the back side we're on the the downward slope um, things are getting tighter everywhere and people are going to react um i mean you either have an open heart and an open mind and you take in the science and you take in the the ethics of how to handle this situation or you react maybe in the more uh instinctive way is to close down close down information close down emotions and say i want it the way it used to be um and and that's what we have a like a um this now um far right wing government in sweden and i think if it happened in sweden i think it 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 may be happening other places as well that we're reacting to what we need the way we need to react and the way we are reacting and then we need in the can we say the alternative eco village network scene to know how to react to that that still trying to support the mainstream system in trying to to reduce uh the suffering that's going to happen at the same time is to be very conscious that we cannot rely on the mainstream system to fix things we have to figure out how do we adapt to what's coming and that, that's basically where i am now the, the best way to deal with this echo anxiety which they say now 90% of young people suffer from echo anxiety is action you just have to turn it into action and i was just thinking what i did yesterday so yesterday in the morning i was working with our biogas and aeroponic system um trying to uh um work with some of the modifications there we're trying to figure out how to both make our own microbiogas uh, which is an energy source that is standalone and would function even in a collapsed world directly connected to an aeroponic system where we would be growing food from the processed water of that biogas um and basically to try to make that so that also that is standalone and can be done so that with that technology people could be producing a very low tech simple energy source and food source even for people that lack soil and water uh and still be able to produce food and i think that is um the situation for about half of the planet is lack of access to food to water and la lack of access to soil and a need for food so i think it's really interesting so working with that we just was inspired by a a german professor at a exhibition on biotechnology in Dortmund to try to grow more important food items in this aeroponic system so I was working with uh soybeans and chickpeas now to try to see if we can grow those without soil using the process water from biogas which it comes from our kitchen waste so turning kitchen waste into energy and nutrient water to grow food um and that that's sort of like a, a concrete constructive way of handling um collapse but i had to break off this work with with the the biogas and aeroponics to go into the city 
where I'm in the regional council um, and I'm in the environment and building council and to sit with politicians from across the spectrum on the future of the water and sewage system of our island. We're on an island in the middle of the Baltic Sea. It's leaking nutrients into the Baltic Sea, causing eutrophication, um, algae blooms, at the same time as the this, this island is suffering from water shortages every summer because of Anthropocene man-made uh, uh, leading of all the draining of all the natural wetlands and water off into the sea. Um, so it's we've built a crazy system and and work and that's why it's quite as I, I don't know I'm, I'm testing myself is that a really smart way to work but it was actually working with people across the political spectrum including from what I would call the racist party um, explaining that we're, this is not a smart thing. This is not a good thing for us. If you can, there's enough rain. If we just collect the rain, if we work with nature, we'll have enough water. We can use nature to clean that water. Um, this is nutrients that we're putting out into the sea that we can actually use for our farmers to continue to produce uh, food in a cost-effective way. So trying to convince uh right wing and ultra right wing that actually uh, working with nature is still possible. We can do these shifts. So it, it feels very, um, um, yeah, uh, schizophrenic to be focusing both on preparing uh, for collapse in the echo village and still trying to reach out to the mainstream society to try to say maybe you could consider making it less harsh that which is coming at the same time you can't really talk about collapse in the mainstream I don't say that word I don't talk about those things because then people would immediately shut down but if they understand something is cost effective robust um, th then they're still interested We work in many different ways. I mean, we have different work domains. So we have um, gardening. We have this this uh, um, the dome where we're working with the biogas and aeroponics. We have others working with infrastructure and eco building, um, and, and yeah, and a few other teams. We have also international projects, and of course, a lot of people coming here as European Solidarity Corps volunteers or similar. Um, I think it is a, it's a theme that comes out quite often. Um, we try to bring in echo anxiety and the work with echo anxiety. We have a very intimate cooperation with the uh, Deep Adaptation Forum, um, and that um, that work there with basically the psychology, the psychological processes of acceptance. Um, then. Um, yeah, I mean, working working with with other ways of 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 dealing with it, uh, dealing with uh, yeah, how do we react in the world of collapse? I mean, discussing it internally. We also have our own um, building up our own resilience as a community, which means um, with uh, increasing electricity prices, increasing fuel prices. How do we react? Um, so at the moment we have one community car which is run on biogas, biogas that we have to purchase um, because our biogas is raw biogas and not not uh, upgraded biogas. Um, but uh, yeah, we also have installed heat pumps. Luckily, um, before the energy crisis, that radically reduces our need for electricity, but also trying to integrate in other forms of energy. But we've, I mean, this is. It's old. It's old news because I mean the Echo Village movement has been preparing for collapse, whether conscious or unconscious. It's it, we've been doing it. So if you read these collapse sites, basically they tell you do what Jen is doing, mm -hmm. um, do what Echo Villages are doing. So we have been preparing, trying to build up um, food sovereignty, um, local energy so sovereignty. Um, so, so these are the the things that we should be doing, and we've been doing. Um, maybe the current energy crisis is making a point that we need to 
a lot of the things that we had working, we need to really make sure they're delivering um, so that we have a lot of alternative energy systems here like wind power, solar, um, biogas, et cetera. Maybe we have to make sure that they're actually delivering to the community because it will save us money. Um, so we have a lot of things that that just need tweaking. The ethical aspects, it's both working with ourselves, what who we are and what we want, and then also deciding what type of community we are, how open we are to the world, etc. Um, I, I think uh, that the, on the first point of who we are, um, what do we want out of life, and um, I, I think there is some sort of um, uh, type of person that is open to voluntary simplicity, who's opening to being part of rewilding and being reconnected to nature. I think this is sort of what who we are in the Echo Village movement. And then we realize now it's getting really serious. And that means acceptance of the process of trying to find our place in nature, accepting um, that some things that we have been very comfortable and accommodated with all of our lives, maybe we have to release those things now that they don't serve anymore and that uh, we have to be willing to change. So, I mean, I think in the Echo Village movement, we've always worked on this being open to personal development and change. And I think this is coming in very concretely and clearly now that maybe there are some habits you really have to release that we don't do that anymore and that open to new habits that, yeah, I haven't done that before. I haven't eaten that before. I haven't tried that instead of something that was um, not positive or something like this and be open for changing lifestyle. So I think that's really important for our movement now is to be open for change um, and to uh, question a lot of our old habits that maybe don't serve anymore. Um, on the ethical side, yeah, deciding as a community, are you um, an open community, inclusive community, a love-based community, um, or are, are you something else, which I think happens. It's very easy to fall into the trap of fear. Um, you know, do you have empathy for everyone or not? And I realize there is, there, there can be a time when this is going to be um, difficult. We can't, if in a real crisis, you cannot accommodate 300 new people in your community. I mean, we look to our, our friends in Ukraine who are actually accepting, are testing the border. I think uh, with Busha accepting over 200 people, now they have to say no to people. They have to turn away people. That's very good uh, experience for us, the Echo Village Network, what happens in a crisis when you finally can't say, sorry, we can't accept anymore. Our systems will collapse. Um, preparing for that, but also realizing that that has to happen. But until that crisis is at that point, um, how do we react to the rest of the world? How do we um, how do we be inclusive? How do we share? There, there, it's it's not a zero sum game. That if we don't share, if if we hold our information about how to survive in collapse, that somehow we get it better. Uh, it's not so. It's it's actually we would have it better if more people would um, shift to what we're talking about. So if we have other communities around us who have also shifted, um, those are our communities we can cooperate in the future and it will be possible for us to uh, thrive better if we have similar like-minded communities around us. Um, so, so we want to actually share. Um, and I think we want to share just because um, we want to see less suffering in the world. And the more people that can make the shift and figure out how to move closer in working, living um, as part of nature, um, the less suffering there'll be. So that's something I think is it's a win-win for us. There's no reason why you would want to be a fear-based community 
um, exclusive shutting down, arming yourself, or something like this. This is not this is not what our movement is about. Um, so we have to be careful. I, it's it's incredible how some of the, that thinking and ideas are so, com, coming so close to our our network that we really have to be very careful about um, about being love based. Uh, empathetic communities. I was very clearly um, born into this um, linear, if not exponential growth society, you know, that everything was going to get bigger and better. And even though we can consciously say we, we, we we distance ourselves from that. That's there's still this um, desire of, you know. I mean, I think this is natural when we we talk about building up our our communities, etc. And let's have this big community hall, and and let's build this new this and that and the other. So we're thinking like that, and maybe it's not bad. We need to be able to receive and accept more people, but things are very uncertain. Um, and being flexible, both practically, physically, but also mentally for now, it might prove that we're in the wrong place um, or we've been doing things in the wrong way. It may be that we have to accept much more people into our community than we thought. Um, but also I would say, so it's, it's part, in part connected to the fact that things are changing very fast. The earth is changing very fast. Um, and we're getting new signals and, and that things are maybe going faster than we thought. So I think we need to be very flexible in what's the right way to go. What do we need? Um, maybe we need to build more food storage or water storage or, or something like that that we haven't thought about. Um, at the same time as realizing um, the basically the 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 I mean, the earth has been really damaged and and also the, the CO2 that's been emitted. You know, it's not like um, if you're green, let's continue to build because we're building green houses. So let's continue to um, pour cement or concrete in our eco village because, you know, we're doing green things. You know, what when the CO2 uh, budget has been used up it's been used up and we're pretty much there and that that's why that 30 year thinking of all these you know big infrastructure and digging in big infrastructure etc maybe that's a bit passe now that we're past that and that um we have to think lighter um we have to think of let's reuse the buildings we already have and this is something I'm practically trying to push in local politics, is we don't have to approve more new buildings. The, the population right now is not expanding. So there must be a lot of empty buildings and figuring out how to get people to move to those empty buildings, how we can make it simpler for uh, on the regulations to allow people to um, make a agricultural barn or a um, a warehouse or a factory into housing, you know, and how can we think in a lighter way that we don't have to always, you know, excavate and dig and also getting people to accept things like dry toilets or other things where we don't need new infrastructure, um, trying to build more and more infrastructure, which feels also quite passe. Um, so we want this very local decentralized uh, localized light society. Um, so we don't need to be doing this huge infrastructure excavation construction that we were maybe thinking about in the past. We have a common understanding of the problems facing us, but actually Jen is coming with solutions, constructive solutions. We go back to the echo anxiety. We're actually doing something about those things and our answers make sense. Um, I mean, it is holistic. It, it, it's been developing slowly over at least 50 years, you know, trying to figure out what is the response to what's happening. And 
and I, I think we have more or less figured it out. We haven't figured out everything, but we've more or less figured things out. Um, and that if people hear that that we have answers to those questions, and we also have to think, you know, making our answers uh, applicable even outside of a very unusual echo village uh, environment. How can these, how can the solutions that we're working on make sense in the wider society? Um, so yeah, that's this is a challenge, but they do make sense. That's what I was saying just from my last days that that people in the political opposition uh, can understand most of what we're talking about at the conceptual level because it's obvious. It's obvious, and then it's. Actually, I think I think you pointed to it. Where we actually stop is strangely enough. It's when we come to these very practical behavioral things. So conceptually, everyone is completely supportive until you get to the behavioral things. And uh, from yesterday in the past week, it's been this. You know, with the flush toilet, that the flush toilet was a very big mistake. Um, made some hundred and 20 or so years ago, and we, we really created a huge problem for ourselves, but it's 120 years of culture and habit that we'd have to change, and this is just not on the table. It's not thinkable for people. Um, I, think, I think there probably is funding available to work specifically on that of getting people to open up and um, realize that non-water-based um, sewage systems or whatever you want to call it, sanitation systems uh, can be, you know, just as attractive as this very um, short-sighted uh, water-based system that we have is dominating everywhere. So it's about per personal behavioral change. And I don't know if anyone has the the miracle answer, how are we going to get that to happen? The change is coming. Uh, you can't really break natural laws. Um, things will be coming back, and they are coming back now. And that's what we see, that, that you know, nature's uh, ability to absorb uh, has met its limits. And then we start to see the answer is back and we're just shocked by what happens. And, you know, there is so much delay, uh, both in climate, but also in, in other, um, where the seas can absorb so much, the seas can take so much beating, um, uh, so many other aspects of nature can take so much um, maltreatment that we're now seeing a reaction to maybe, you know, things that have happened years ago. So I, I think, uh, you know, what advice, I don't know. I mean, I think pr the behavioral change will be forced. Unfortunately, it will be forced. And people that don't have the mentality straight on this are going to suffer so much more because of their own mentality. Um, so the, it, it, you know, they're sure that this will be, um, a worse lifestyle than what they have now. So they're going to be negatively uh, approaching every change and it's going to be perceived in a negative way. Um, so they will, they will actually feel this change that's going to be forced upon them by nature um, as much more unpleasant than it need be. And that's why there's going to be a huge dichotomy between those of us who actually in some ways are welcoming change you know this is it's 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 a painful process and there's a lot of suffering that of course we don't want to see but you know we have to pay for 10,000 years of uh, misbehavior and and it's it's going to be a shock but those of us who realize wow connecting with nature having a richer life and that a lot of this life that is being offered is not what it's made out to be. Um, and that we're so receptive and welcoming for this, the change that's coming, receptive and positive 
for the change that's coming that makes it so much more easy so it's actually so if there was something to teach children is to be positive in receiving uh and, and adapting to that change um because it's going to make it so much easier and to be open-minded um and that it's going to be a generational thing that you have the parents generation that is bitter about um things are changing and and then young people and children that are open for change and i think we've seen this in past generations so maybe that's what we have to look at that whatever is you know it was computers and mobile telephones etc that we have this sort of generational gap today and resistance etc um, but this will now be spreading into other areas where there's resistance um, to living closer to nature but this is actually the the obvious way to actually have the good life the good life is going to be found in the echo villages or whatever comes after echo villages when echo villages become so much more commonplace and interwoven that it becomes normal society i support everyone in trying to find your personal pathway in this um very important important historic time when the world is changing and um yeah and i think everyone needs to be on their personal uh, path of searching for the right answers there's no one that ha that has a monopoly on the right answers um but i think if we keep our hearts open we we can feel the difference between what is what is positive healthy um paths forward and what's not <laughs>